partly funded by the OnTrack Foundation, which is a UK registered charity that is itself is funded by OnTrack Safaris um, that, are, that is owned by Will and Carol Fox. I think maybe some of you know them uh, because they used to live in, in Hoosbred a couple of years ago. So the net profit from OnTrack Safaris goes into the foundation that then goes into Ingwe. Okay. So yeah, this is Will and Carol, just going to present them briefly, but yeah, they're just wildlife conservationists. Will was a former director of Wild Earth, um, and so yeah, they received like the World Responsible Travel Award for their work in conservation. Um, so I'm going to show you a bit what has been done in the past with Ingwe, and then I move to what is happening now in, in the present. <coughs> All right. Cute leopard, eh? Beautiful. <laughs> All right, so here I just want to basically, so we're all a bit on the same page regarding the latest information on leopards. So first, if we look at the, at the map over there, so we have the habitats. Um, I mean, that's the whole South Africa. So leopards have globally disappeared from 67% of their range in South Africa. Um, and only 20% of South Africa is considered to be suitable leopard habitat. But what is interesting to note is that 63% actually of this 20% of suitable habitat is outside of protected areas. But if we look at the amount of projects that have been done in South Africa, 95% of all of the projects in South Africa actually only focus on leopard inside of protected areas. And 85% of publications are also done inside protected areas. So there is a bit of a discrepancy between the reality on the ground and what's happening in terms of research. Of course, doing research in protected areas is much easier than it is outside of protected areas. But yet, there is a need also to start looking at what's happening outside. Then if we look at population, so the population of leopards worldwide is decreasing. So I think you all know that leopards don't only occur in southern Africa, they also occur in a lot of different countries. Um, so the global population is decreasing. Uh, and in 2015, the leopards were moved from being near threatened on the IUCN uh, redly species to vulnerable. Um, and then if we look in South Africa, it was estimated there is a national decline of about 16%, and it went up to 40% in KZN. Now if we look at the number, the population estimates for leopards is between 2.8 and 11.6 thousand. So it's actually it's a huge range, it's a huge gap, so it means that we actually don't know how many leopards are actually living in South Africa, but yet a lot of decisions are being taken into account, are using those numbers to make a decision on what on best management practice for leopards. But like, there is a, an opportunity to actually work on those numbers, um, and I will explain how. So like, to try to refine a bit this number. And then if we look at the threat, <coughs> so as it is for many species, habitat fragmentation is one of the main threats, not only for leopards, but for species, a lot of species in general. Uh, there's human wildlife conflict retaliation through illegal killing, like poisoning, uh, the issue of damage causing annual permits that also, although they are being regulated by the government, it's been shown also that in some areas um, the, the regulation can be quite poor um, and then there is not enough um, information that are getting back to actually the government. Um, snares also, trophy hunting quota not being evenly distributed. So again, trophies, we know, I mean in the area um, there's been a lot of limits about the number of uh, trophy hunting quotas, but globally that's also been a threat to the leopards. Um, illegal hunting for skins, for cultural regalia, which is mainly in KZN, um, from the Shambe community. <coughs> but there's been amazing work done uh, by Panthera, another organization that is actually now trying to provide new, um, like, uh, fake fur to the Shambe community so they stop killing the leopards. And, and it's, from what I understand, it's quite a, a good success. And then there's a trade also for body parts. Okay. Another cute picture. <laughs> Same leopard. <laughs> All right. So just for, for you to have a bit of an idea of what Ingwe did in the past. Um, so Ingwe was mainly about camera traps. So they used, so this was not, and I was not involved at that stage. Um, so with camera traps, they did population estimate. They looked at habitat preferences. They looked at movements, the way study. Um, they had camera traps in two different reserves. They did also scat sample to understand presence, diet, and genetics. And all of these results is in the PhD publication by Dr. Tara Piri, which is now a professor from the University of Reading in the UK. 
Some leopards were also being rescued from human wildlife conflict, and they, they also did a lot of awareness raising by um, doing education work in different communities. So that was a couple of years ago. All right, so now, what is Ingwe about today? So the aim of this project now, there is, there is a couple, so is to provide data to update leopard distribution map. So this is actually one of the requests from uh, SAMBI, so the Southern African National Biodiversity Institute, and from the IUCN CAT Specialist Group. So it's been a while that there haven't been new um, data being collected. So this project is going to focus on a small area, but it's at the global scale of all of South Africa, there is a need actually to get more um, updated information. Then it's also to understand leopard movement between all of the reserves in all of this area. Um, you all live in different reserves, different wildlife estates. So understand how leopards are actually moving from one area to another. To study population trend at the scale of wood spread. Um, and to demonstrate the benefits of citizen science in supporting research. So I think if some of you are not sure what citizen science is, it's basically is getting the people um, involved in research by helping out by logging um, sightings of leopards. So all of you can actually start contributing to this project. It's not only about researchers now, it's about everyone. So citizen science is um, quite well known for birds actually, um, but very little is being done with, uh, with carnivores and other species. So time basically to all get involved together. The sum of the question that we can try to answer by, uh, with this project. So there are a couple, they're non-exhaustive, more could come up. Maybe you will have some questions that you might want to ask also that we can add. Um, but basically it's either R40 and the R527, like some of the two main road barriers to leopard dispersal and to other species. Um, so are we, am I going, are we going to see like leopards moving from one area to another? I think a lot of you said yes, definitely. A lot of the leopards are moving. But are these places actually the roads safe enough for all of this wildlife to cross? What mitigation measure can we put in place to maybe avoid having so many animals being killed on this road? And from what I remember, from my time when I was living here, especially the R40 is quite a dangerous road in general, not only for wildlife, but also for people. <laughs> then how do leopards share the territory and what is their extent at the global level? Where do leopards go when they live on a reserve? A lot of the actually reserves that are already involved in the project, some, they mentioned that, okay, we had this leopard, now it's gone. Where is it? Oh, it's been killed, or it's been snared, or it just disappeared. But maybe it's just in the neighboring reserve. So it's time to have a look globally at what's happening at the whole of the Hootsby scale. And then are leopard numbers declining, increasing, or being stable in the area? Again, at the whole of the, at our scale, at the Hootsby scale, it's never been really studied altogether. A lot of studies being done in the Sabisan, again by Panthera, where now they, they've been studying the leopards for years and they have an idea that if the leopard, how the leopard population is going, what I understand is decreasing a bit, but now what's happening here? No one is being studied this whole area yet by involving absolutely everyone. So some of the questions, again, non-exhaustive. So some of the methods basically that um, to, to, to conduct this research is to work with reserves that are inside but also outside of protected areas, so to get everyone involved, to encourage citizen science, so all of you to log direct observation whenever you're going to see a leopard or tracks and signs, use camera traps, so it's mainly at the moment using camera traps that already are deployed, which can be in the wildlife estates, private properties, farms, anyone would be willing to share that information. Uh, utilize wildlife photograph submitted on social media, so that's also quite linked to some of the wildlife estates that are sharing all of the images, for example, on Facebook, then let's harness this data um, and then can use them for the research. And then use technology to reduce costs and optimize results. So I will just explain a bit more what are the two technologies that are being used. So as I mentioned to the data, there's two types of data that can be collected. There is what we call presence-only data. So data when only when a leopard is being sighted then you log the information and this allows to map leopard distribution. Then there is survey data that helps to estimate leopard density and trend. These are a bit more um, complicated and robust data to get. That will get a bit into details also. But the idea with all of this data is that they will they follow the SAMBI protocols because I want all of this data to fit into the national um, database for the leopards. So SAMBI has actually wrote down all protocols um, and 
the aim again is to just to follow it to make sure that it all makes sense and all of it can be um, analyzed at the national scale. Some of the expected outcomes, again, non-exhaustive, uh, provide information to landowners and to authorities to facilitate reason decision by policy makers, um, to implement mitigation measures, for example, on the road, be speed bump, it could be um, uh, creating some uh, corridors, I don't know, we'd like to discuss it all, um, to increase awareness, to do some community involvement, also that would be in stage two of the research, because first we need to understand where the lipids are and where like the hotspots and then to do peer review publication, so this would be in partnership with different university and different uh, organizations that we'll mention shortly. Okay. So for most of the data that are being uh, collected, they, um, I'm using the SMART uh, mobile app. Um, so SMART is for spatial monitoring and reporting tool. It is used worldwide by conservation organization and initially it was designed to conduct anti-poaching patrol um, and I believe actually I've heard, learned today that people from Farmwatch, if I'm not mistaken, are using the, this app um, but there's also a way to manipulate the app in a way that it can collect um, sightings data. So this is how it looks like um, and there's two different options that are available so I would just mention them now but basically on that app Whenever you have it on your phone, you have to take a picture because I've used pictures for individual identification and then enter simple information as a number of individuals. Um, ID, if you know, because I know a lot of you actually know the leopards in your area, you might have given them name, although sometimes the names are the same for one reason to another and it gets all a bit confusing, but basically you all know them and it can help me also um, to, uh, to identify those leopards. Um, and then any comment that you like to share that can be added on, on the app. So for the app, I made a citizen uh, science um, interface. So initially, I would mention in that, but a lot of the research already involved in the project as their own uh, interface. But there will be one also for all of you to, uh, to download and to get on your phone. So with that one, so you can start also recording any sightings of leopards. Um, so as I mentioned, there's two different types of data. So there's a report incident option, and then there's a start patrol option. On the report incident, again, it's only presence, only data, so you will only log information when you see a leopard or when you see uh, tracks and signs. So this can be done continuously, and it's a typical citizen science data. So you log all of the information. Then the start patrol option, which is something that is a bit more thorough, that is more for the reserves that are going on game drive, for the wildlife estate that are going uh, regularly on a drive, um, and this is to use study density, so basically, what happened there is that for, for the lodge, for example, when, you, when the guide goes on the game drive, the app is going to record every minute interval where, it, where it's going. So at the end, I will have what is called monitoring effort, and I will, have, I will know how much of the reserve is being covered, how many hours the guide was out there. And with all of this information, to make it short, it, like, it gets into like a matrix of zero and one, and then I know if a leopard has been seen on that game drive or not. And with those information, I'm then able to deduce uh, density. Okay. But for, for this, what is important is that it needs to be done for six weeks. And it needs to be done for six weeks all at the same time. So all of the reserve involved need to get together and to all decide, okay, let's say in September, for six weeks, we're all collecting data at the same time and it all goes to the same project. And then a minimum also area that needs to be covered is 10,000 <laughs> hectares in order to fit with the CMB protocol. Like nothing can be done normally under 10,000 hectares. So that's why we need to combine reserves. So I'll show you a bit of an on the map after you will understand how everything fits in together. So on this graph, what I want to show you that today is actually only once there's been a similar study that's been done, it was done in Botswana in the Delta. And these researchers, they compare four different methods to study carnivores density. So they use it on the top five carnivores. And what they did is so they use a calling station, they did a spool survey, they used camera trap, and they used citizen science. For citizen science, every single guest that were going on a game drive at, at this specific camp, they were given a GPS that was recording again where the vehicle was going and then all the guests had to share their photograph and then the timestamp of the photograph was being matched with 
the GP application. And with that, they were able actually to, same as what I want to do, they were able to do a density estimate. And all four methods basically gave similar estimates. But the citizen science first was the first, the only one that managed to capture cheetah. None of the other um, methodology allowed it. And then if you look at the cost, it was by far the cheapest one. And also, the camera traps are amazing because they can be deployed at night in a lot of different remote areas. So they are great tools. But in areas where people are actually going on game drive, where people are active on their reserves, let's use citizen science rather, much cheaper. In terms of like the data collection time, <coughs> you can see also camera tracks, takes a long time because we need to deploy them, you need to go and check them regularly. Um, while citizen science, you basically, it doesn't change anything on your day-to-day -day life because it's part of your whole operation now. So you just use what exists already. So yeah, so that was an amazing study that was done. Um, and the conclusion was citizen science has a huge role to play and we actually, that should be deployed at a larger scale to try to um, help research and, and conservation in general. So then the other tool or technology I'm using is the African Carnivore Wild Book. So ACW was created by a Canadian NGO called Tech for Conservation. Actually the lady who created it, she came to the Delta, she absolutely um, love carnivores in general and she decided to put to create this software um, and to make it free of use for all conservationists to start using AI to help them deal with a huge amount of data and you, with all of these images. So it uses an AI algorithm that was developed by WildMe that is a bit of a bigger platform that exists for many different species um, and so but ACW only focuses on the top, top five carnivores and it uses um, pattern recognition to help with identification. For, for the lion, they managed to get it so that for when, if you have a facial picture of the whiskers pattern, then the AI is actually being trained now to recognize lion looking at their whiskers. So very, very powerful. So all of the photographs that are being submitted as part of the research is being uploaded on the African Carnival White Book. And how it works basically is that when a picture is being submitted, the AI right away is going to detect the animal in the picture, so it's going to put a box, and then it's going to understand if it's going to be if it's the right flank, the left flank, facial picture, rear of the leopard. So right away, the AI knows, and then it's going to compare every right flank pictures with the other right flank pictures. So it does it pretty quickly, and then it gives a score, and with the score, it is then for the researcher to decide if yes, it agrees with the AI, and these two leopards are the same. So the AI will never do the final confirmation, so it needs to be like someone being trained to actually identify leopards um, to uh, confirm and then once you say that picture A and B are actually from one individual, they get together and they are, um, and, uh, and the, you create an ID kit for that leopard and then you get more and more information for, and then you get all of the information for that specific leopard on the platform. You can see also that the AI works well with poor image quality. Um, so here at the bottom, that was a leopard that was captured in the cluster um, by camera traps. So I knew, I know these two leopards are the same because the pictures were taken one after another. But the AI was very strong enough to be able to detect that actually these are the same individuals. If it was a human eye, the likelihood that a human would have actually gone through all of this um, and managed to, to match this individual would have been very, very low and it would have been a bit of a headache for the researchers. But the AI does, does everything all by itself, um, so it's quite, it's quite amazing. So just to give you an idea of how, how powerful can be citizen science actually. So as I said, there is there's ICW that exists, so you can see there's over 6,000 carnivores that have been identified that have an ID kit now on ICW. Other organizations like EWT, the Angela Wildlife Trust, is actually using this uh, platform for uh, the wild dogs, and I know Glenn Beverly is the number one contributor for wild dog images on the platform. Um, there's over 20,000 sightings that have been reported. So I will explain now, but there is also a part of this platform where people can just submit their pictures and contribute to the whole of the database. And then, so 1,600 different people have actually been contributing on, on ACW. But it also exists for zebras, giraffe, and sharks and whales and there's also for turtles, there's, in total there's 52 species that are actually being um, analyzed through the AI algorithm of wild meat. So it shows with 
that's a huge amount of information that now thanks to AI can actually be um, taken care of all at once and save a lot of time for researchers. So this is just the, the on ACW, there is a platform, there is a platform for researchers, a platform for citizen scientists. And as a citizen scientist, from now on, what you can do, you, whenever you see a leopard, or any of the carnivals actually, you can just upload your pictures on the platform. You just need the, 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 the metadata of your photographs, so like your date and time, is automatically <coughs> extracted by ACW. The only thing that you need to do is to point where, the, where your sighting was. It doesn't need to be exactly precise, but more or less where it was. And that way, all the researchers then get access to all of your images. And you, if your leopard, for example, has been spotted um, much by a, a researcher in a different areas, you're going to receive an email saying, oh, your picture actually has been matched, and this is that individual. And from now on, you can start following that individual. You will know where it is. So it's really interactive, so you won't have, you won't have the exact the occasion for data security, but you will have the area, and then whenever this leopard again is spotted, you will start basically knowing what's happening to him or to her. Um, so yeah, so that's just a bit of a just to show you a bit how how it works. Okay. So yeah, so just some of the benefits of AI for conservation. So number one, help tackle global challenges such as biodiversity loss. I think we're all aware that globally we are in a phase of a bit of a biodiversity collapse and AI can actually help by having a better understanding of the rate of this collapse and what are we going to do about this. Again, it's very inexpensive because it's all free to, it's actually very, uh, it's free to use, it's all free software and it can be, it's very valuable for a conservation organizations that are always struggling with funds, uh, we're always looking for funds and at least to have this type of software free makes our life easier. It also allows to save a lot of time, as you can imagine, by having so many pictures now being um, worked at by the AI instead of by us. It means that it's working in the background and then you can, we can focus on something different. <laughs> and just to give you an idea, there is another platform that's called Trap Tagger that helps dealing with camera trap images. Well, the same way you can put all of your pictures, you can put 10,000 pictures on Trap Tagger. The AI is going to sort your pictures, but it's going to put the grass on one side, vehicle on another, human, birds, even bird species, all the young palas, all your elephants, all your leopards. It's going to categorize everything for you, which is absolutely amazing. And if you look for camera traps, take, as I said, it takes a lot of time for people to go mm -hmm. through it. But now, all of this, the AI is doing it for us. And just to give you an example, like for a set amount of images, it would take a human about 320 hours to get through all of this. It takes the AI one hour. And in terms of cost, it's like it would cost the researchers $6,400 for that amount. But for the AI, it would only cost $20. So that's just like comparison to show how powerful actually AI is for conservation. Also, how do you reduce human error? Um, I think because we get we, as a human, you get fatigued by going through all of these pictures. And if we had to look through 100 pictures of leopard, I promise by the end I would just get all confused. And we only see spots and then won't be able to recognize anything. <laughs> but now the AI would never get tired and actually I'd be much more um, accurate than I will ever be. <laughs> then it's also completely non-invasive in the sense that this project is all about non-invasive techniques, so I will never, I will, I'm not planning on putting any colors on any of the leopards. I'm not planning on capturing any leopards. I only use photograph, and this is completely non-invasive. And this is what you guys are doing whenever you see an animal, you photograph it. So let's just harness that. Again, then I mentioned a lot of metadata can be extracted from the photograph directly, which is when you share your image, um, just a bit easier. Then there is automated data classification. This is what I mentioned, especially with Trap Tiger, where it can classify all of your images in specific folder. And you can also like tell the AI, actually, I only want to have a look at carnivores images. So the AI will sort out all of your carnivores in the right folder, and all the rest will go in a separate folder. So that's also you can decide how much information you want to extract out of this in all of your images. 
And then it also does um, automated data analysis. So, for example, on the African Carnival White Book, whenever leopards are being uploaded, so they have their own ID kit, I'm actually able to see which leopard has been seen with who. So there is a co-occurrence diagram that are being created. So very quickly, I get to use this. These two have been seen in the same areas. We can also create family trees, because I think a lot of you know which leopard um, are related to who, and I'm able to put this into uh, ACW. I'm able to say, this leopard is the father of that one, and then we start creating whole family trees that then can be extracted and given back, so we all have an understanding of how all our leopards are related. There's a lot of things that can be done. Um, a lot of information can be extracted to create maps as well. Um, so it's just fantastic software. So I said this project started in January. Basically the first piece of the joint in were in January. So I just want to show you already how much has been submitted. So yeah, so this is of course all of the Limpopo area. So I said I'm working in the Huspet areas. You guys are not the only one. <laughs> I also included the, started to do some work in the Waterberg as well, where I'm heading tomorrow. Um, because there also there is opportunity to start getting people on board and to collaborate. So there will be two areas. But Huspet is for now the, the biggest with the most uh, reserves involved. So there is 19 reserves in total that have been enrolled in the project. 16 with ongoing discussion. But since I arrived in Huspet about a week ago now, many more actually came on board. So I'll show you a bit on the map. So yeah, so here, here the map. Um, so like in the dark green, first you can see these are the formerly protected areas, according to the maps from the government. And then the rest is outside protected areas. So there is a bit of both. Um, and the whole idea, so you have all of the reserves that are enrolled now. So just to show a bit. So this is classery camps. They only camp so far in the classery that is participating. Hopefully we'll get more people on board. If any of you have contact in the classeries, please tell them to join the project. But then we have in the Beluli areas, this Pondoro Lodge that has joined. There is also this organization, that's WEI, the Wildlife and Ecological Investments, is actually a student's organization. So they have also, uh, they're doing work over there. So they are, I don't have the outline yet, but they are on board. Now they're in. Um, recently, Transfrontier Africa also joined, and they are on three different areas. So they will also uh, start collecting data. Then we have Wild River here with Rikia Safari Camp. There's Lisa Taba. And then there is Puya Moza in the middle also that has joined the project now. And then a bit more south, so we have the Respect Game Reserve. Uh, so with Karen Glovu, Ledwood, and Globank that are participating. So we found some of the first ones that joined in. There's Raptors View also with all of the, so the wildlife estates. Uh, I think I'm sure quite a few of you are from there. <laughs> so um, they're also participating mainly through social media and the camera traps. The Hoospread Wildlife Estate also. Um, <laughs> hey! <laughs> Which all started with thanks to Owen from Searching for Spots. I think you all know him. Uh, he's the first one who got on board and that is um, getting information, I believe, from most of the residents. Um, and then there is Kapama also that joined through Jabulani, Jabulani Lodge. And hopefully more lodge are also going to join to help the team from Jabulani. And then there is Royal Mali One in Thorny Bush also that joined. So, and eco training. I had a meeting yesterday also, and with Pryland, also interested in, in being part of it and including all the guiding, the future guides in learning about research and conservation as well, and to get them to collect data. Um, and then Blue Canyon was the last addition from this afternoon. So as you can see, uh, and Lumbunzio hopefully will also, also the, the more here actually, um, also hopefully will get involved, and um, wherever there is gap, basically, if any of you have contact from these people where there are gaps, um, please let's also just get them involved. But now let me, let me just show you. So all of this together, it's about 51,000 hectares that are actually being surveyed for this labor program. <coughs> but now if I, was to, if, I was to put, if I were to put a polygon around all of this area, right, the rough, rough area, if we were doing the survey all together, working hand in hand, getting all of you to contribute whenever you see a leopard, that's 173,000 hectares that actually could be covered by Ingwe-Levered research. So there is a huge opportunity. And yesterday, I had a meeting uh, with over 25 different people, reserves managers, 
key stakeholders from the areas to make sure that everyone is on board to start actually collaborating and sharing data. Because again, everyone is doing their own thing. Everyone is know what's happening in their reserve, in their wildlife estates. But now let's start sharing. Let's start collaborating so we have an understanding of what's happening at the global picture. That's something that I believe is lacking globally in research and conservation. And it all depends on the people in buying into this project and being keen to, to work together. So this is all about what is it about? Collaboration. So in terms of data, so yeah, I get also some information from the Pillensburg, uh, from the Kruger Park. I get all of the data that are collected by latest sightings, so like the Citizen Science app. Um, so they also sh share all of the information. So of course there's a lot of data in the, in the Kruger. Um, the step-by-step -step will be also be able to, to build the database there and to identify all of those leopards and to see are they actually coming how far they're traveling? Will they be captured in some of the reserve around here? And I know it happened in the past already. Um, but if we look today, since the beginning of the project, I received about 1,500 pictures that were uploaded on the African Carnival World Book, pictures of leopards. There were 100 uploads on the smart mobile app, 202 sightings photos that were added on the smart app also, and over 405 camera traps, images, or videos. <coughs> that were either sent to me or that I was extracting from um, the Facebook page or from what people were actually sending me. So it's quite a, it's quite a big amount of data, knowing it all started, uh, I mean, in January, but to be honest, I had received some data already since <coughs> November. But just to give you an idea of how much is actually being gathered at the moment. And in only three months, to the African, um, the Untracked Foundation actually be became the biggest contributor on the African Carnival Wild Book because of all of the images that were being submitted. So right behind there is and beyond also using ACW. Um, and the great thing is like whenever a leopard is being um, added on the on ACW, if this leopard is actually also being captured by and beyond, we will we will know. We, we can stop chatting between amongst ourselves and say, okay, now let's share the information. So this platform is all we all in it together. We all going to start sharing information. Then there's the Cape Leopard Trust. Very unlikely that some of the leopards from here will be captured by the Cape Leopard Trust. But of course, they're also using the, the platform. And then the Wildlife Act, Wild Tomorrow Fund, and Sia Funda were also contributing. So I think some of you know also that Panthera, they also have their own actually ID platform, uh, where all of the leopards from Sabisan and from Makaladi are being uploaded there. Uh, hopefully, both platform one day will be merged. Again, the aim is to get all of us to collaborate, actually. Okay. So that's beyond me. This is between ACW and Panthera, but I know they work, they're talking about it. So let's hope that we can start sharing at a bigger scale. So yeah, so just a couple of partners. So there's the Waterberg Research Support Center. So that's for the whole of the Waterberg area. Um, and then I've actually recently signed an MOU with the University of Pretoria because they're going to be providing students to analyze the data from the Waterberg. And then from the data from here, there's different options. Um, so there is some student potentially from the University of Reading, which is in the UK. So ideally I'd rather work with university in South Africa, but why the UK? Just because the foundation is registered there and the, the lady who did her PhD with Ingwe is from there, and she's very keen to stay on board, so as to have students also working on this data as part of their thesis, basically. And then there is uh, Wildlife and Ecological Investment, and I want to add also Transfrontier Africa, that will also provide students to work on the data from here, and the aim is to get regular reports that can be given to all of the landowners, um, the, the reserve, but most importantly, of the whole area. I'd rather have a look at the global picture than, again, per entity. Um, so all of this is in progress. To be honest, I'm, I'm only one running this project, so it is quite a lot of work, um, and I, I don't have the time right now to um, analyze all of the data. That's why I'm partnering with university, and for students, it's actually amazing opportunities to start for them to work on real data, and then they could actually come eventually and be here doing a talk to present to you what are the results of the whole study. So how can you actually support the whole project? The first one, 
or you can become a citizen scientist. You can join all of us, all of the reserves that are already participating, and you can start sharing <coughs> any data, any leopard sighting, any leopard tracks that you will see. The only thing you have to do, and I'm going to put the link at the end, is to download the app and to start contributing, actually. So all of you now, all together, we can actually uh, have a very good understanding of what's happening out there. That can also be if you, you just drive and you see, you're lucky enough to see a leopard crossing the road. Okay, you, you might struggle a bit to take a picture, but you can still love the information though. So again, you all, we all have a role to play and you all have a role to play. This is where you live, so we can again get together and, and really work together. And then, of course, I mentioned earlier, I mean, I'm a research organization, I have to struggle a bit with funds, uh, but there's a different way that you can also help out there. First, you can choose to go on a safari with on track safaris. I know because you guys are here, you already live in the bush, you're not necessarily going to go on a drive, but you can mention about on track. Um, they do safaris in nine different countries. Um, so you're welcome to have a look at the website. All the links will be given at the end, just in case. <laughs> Um, so you can go with them, you can donate also to directly to the OnTrack Foundation website. Um, I have I brought quite a lot of uh, beautiful uh, tote bags here that if you want to participate and get involved in the project for any donation of over 200 rand, you can go back with your tote bag, play the, the Ingwe Leopard Research logo on it, and at the back it's written, I'm a citizen scientist. So if you guys want to become a citizen scientist, please get your bag. Um, then you can also just follow us on, I mean, follow me, <laughs> it's just me, uh, on Instagram. <laughs> I need to stop saying us because, yeah, just me and myself sometimes. <laughs> so, yeah, you can follow the project on Instagram and on Facebook, so it's under Ingwe Leopard Research. And then I also have a newsletter that I write every month just to give a bit of an update on who's joined, which are the latest reserves that joined in, how many sightings were shared, um, who are the biggest contributors for the month, etc. Okay. Another way to get involved, start drinking wine, but not any wine, <laughs> that wine. <laughs> so, avid wine, actually, they, it's quite a small wine farm in Stellenbosch, and how I got it, they are a sponsor for the project. So they give a percentage to all of the, for all of the bottles that are being invoiced, they give a percentage to, I mean, it's not there, he's, he's one guy also. So he gives a percentage to the project as well. Um, so yeah, so it's just a small, small wine farm. There is some bottles here. These are the, how many are they? Five, five bottles here are the only for sales. So please, they are like 250, 275 rand a bottle. So we'll all go directly also to um, the project. And if you want to get some wine, um, there is actually a 10% promo code just for today. So if you want to get your wine, uh, you can scan the QR code that is on this table there. Um, and then you can make your order and then you will receive your wine and then that way you drink wine and have the project. Win-win situation. <laughs> Honestly, the wine is delicious. We had it last night. It's amazing. And the bottles are gorgeous, which is great. <laughs> Always a good thing. And the idea is also to try to get, to get the wine actually uh, distributed in all of the reserves and the lodges that are involved in the project. Because then it adds a new, a nice touch actually. When the guests are involved in the hell idea, at night you can serve them the wine and say, by the way, this one is actually helping out the product that you're participating to as well. So please, drink arid wine. <laughs> okay, and then just some ideas for funding. So as I mentioned, so I'm, I'm looking for funds because the OnTrack Foundation is only able to uh, provide for about one third of the uh, yearly cost, um, just because this is how much profit OnTrack Safaris make. Um, so there's different ideas also, so I'm looking for sponsorships opportunities, so Iron One is one of them, but it could be also other um, companies that might be interested in getting the environmental uh, corporate uh, responsibility going and then they want to get involved in a local project. Um, looking for donation, I will also start a crowdfunding campaign um, in a month or two, also to try to get a bit of money in, so as crowdfunding, whatever money you will be given, you will be given a reward back, um, so it's just yeah, a reward system. And then I start doing raffles, research safaris, that's something um, that also we might try to set up with um, someone I met actually here when I was here, where basically the idea is to market research safaris for the lodges whereby guests will be booking specifically 
um, to participate to the research and then they can also then it will be um, a, an amount of what they're going to be paying will go to the project so it's basically instead of again being passive and just taking pictures just for their own pleasure now they're participating to uh, conservation goodies for sales also so again there's a beautiful tote bags remember 200 rand donation you get a tote bag <laughs> Or you can, you can also, so it can be, by the way, it can be cash or it can be donation on the website directly. They, the, the QR code there, where you can, it's, uh, the website is in pounds, so it's like 10 pounds basically. Um, and then, so hopefully, uh, then some of the boutiques could be interested also in start selling some of the goodies. And then also talking about maybe implementing some research fees. Um, that's for some of the lodges that could be offering also to charge a small extra for their guests. So then they get, um, so they participate to to the research. So, but other ideas are welcome. Um, yeah, please. <laughs> so yeah, just uh, one word for the end. Collaboration is a new competition. Um, if you guys have never listened to this TED talk on YouTube, please listen to it. There's actually a couple of them, very interesting. But basically, yeah, I think Wisbon is a perfect place to start this project to get it going and. The aim is really to prove a concept here. Yeah. If all together we can actually um, support research on conservation on leopard, this model here that we can prove together can be replicable in a lot of different places in South Africa, outside of South Africa, but also for other species, any species that can be identified. So if this works here, we can actually make it very big. And all of this through citizen science and collaboration. Thank you. So just, if you want all of the details for anything, there's my contact details, my email address, your, the website, where to make donation, contacts for Arid Wine, the newsletter, social media, all of it, the smart mobile app also, and ACW for Citizen Scientists. So if you scan the QR, or, or QR code, it will um, prompt you basically to, it will create a link and then you will get all of this information that you can save directly on your phone. And then finally, if you're interested in getting, in having the newsletter, so you can either subscribe directly on the website, or you can also put your name. I wrote a paper here, I have a paper here, when you can leave your email address, um, if you're interested in getting subscribed, I can do it for you as well. And then I also made a list, if you want the app, um, if you want to start participating, either, yeah, use a QR code, or send me also your, give me your email address, so then I can explain you how the app works, so I can, we send you short videos that will go through all of the steps to uh, get the app. But I promise it's simple, uh, it's pretty straightforward, but at least if you have some question, um, you know how to get a hold of me. Okay, now I'm done. Sorry, everybody, before we let Marine go, I just want to check, does anybody have any questions? We have about 10 minutes or so, so if anybody does have any pressing questions, um, Maureen, I'm going to ask you just to repeat the question as well, just so everybody can hear. Steve, hello. Hi, uh, Hi. Just, just going back to the, the ACW and the, the AI, as we record photographs or camera trap images, would we submit them through you, who I know is very busy anyway, or directly to the, uh, to the software to, to get an immediate sort of decision and return? On that image. So yeah, so just to, I don't need to repeat the question. So basically, whenever you have images of uh, leopards or camera traps, is it better to send them directly to me, or is it better to send them directly to the citizen uh, science platform of ACW? I would say rather send them to me directly, because otherwise, when it goes to ACW, it would take me a bit of time for me to get to actually dig into the platform and to find those images. So while if you send them directly to me then I, I can upload them under my name, under the Untrack Foundation, and then I have access to the information right away. So yeah, please through me rather. But you can use it for all of the other species. You can <laughs> put it on the website. <laughs> Sorry, I've also got a question. I'm quite large, so I'm sure everyone can hear me. Um, so we, with birds, we often work on like cryptic species, and this might be a question that's too early, but is there any thought on how you would like compensate for like leopards, like we for example see, where there's very little tourism, persecution, etc. Like sightings are very sparse. 
even though you might have a similar population density, you look at like Sabi Sands, Mala Mala, it's all very habituated, so you get this high volume of sightings of the same individuals. But any ideas on how that could be compensated with maybe sort of targeted camera trapping projects just to kind of benchmark that difference in, in density? Sure. So, yeah, for all of these areas, of course, where we do, won't have enough sightings, where there would be like basically gap, the idea would be to put camera traps. Um, but again, we'll have to fundraise for those camera traps, but yeah. Hopefully, first, let's get an idea of like distribution and understanding where are the gaps, and when we see we have absolutely zero information, yes, then let's put camera trap, let's do a short study there, but I need, I need the cameras, anyone wants to give cameras, and then <laughs> I also need like uh, help on the, on the ground um, and get students involved, but also students, but also you guys, if you're interested in helping out. But yeah, we'll, uh, the aim is to cover places where we don't have sightings. <laughs> Can I have a red wine? <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, everybody, and thanks so much for Marine. I mean, really appreciate you getting up here from Cape Town for a talk. So, yeah, warm round of applause. <laughs>